the opening of the story begins with Rombergstein admonition. He reminds like that no matter what happens, he must never remove the mask from his face or the cloak from his body. Romberg warns that if it reveals his identity, the demon king will show no mercy. I gazes into Romberg's eyes his mind filled with tumultuous thoughts. Suddenly, the one's impregnable fortress is bombarded by a barrage of attacks from goblins. They breach the gates and prepare to massacre everyone inside. The soldiers armed with swords and shields are no match for the goblins. Ferocious onslaught. Chaos ensues within the fortress, walls as the goblins overwhelming in number and brutality slaughter mercilessly. In stark contrast to the chaos below, the general stands quietly by the window in the command room, silently observing the carnage. The sound of like opening the door diverts his attention. The general remains calm upon like sudden appearance, as if he had anticipated his arrival. I presented him with three options, surrender and become a prisoner of the demon king commit suicide to maintain his honor or secretly flee. The general observes I can silence, then makes his move, indicating none of these options are his choice. Like not particularly surprised, draws his staff and swiftly summons a whirlwind spell, killing the general in an instant. I quarters the goblins to cease killing the defenseless soldiers and to treat the wounded prisoners. Alone in the room, Ike finally slowly removes his mask. He is in fact, a normal human being more precisely, a person with the memories of a Japanese individual from a past life reincarnated in this world. Growing up, Ike now serves in the Demon King's army as the current commander of the Immortal Battalion in the 7th Army Corps. He has always strived to hide the pact he made with Romberg knowing that once his true identity is revealed, death is the only path left for him. The room Mike occupies is protected by a powerful magical barrier, impenetrable without his permission, not even a fly could enter. As Ike is about to cast a spell, he is startled to find a maid crouching under the table. The girl also faced Ike and both of them spoke at the same time. She continuously begged for her life, swearing she hadn't seen anything. In her haste to stand up quickly, she hit her head on the edge of the table and fainted on the spot. Like was unsure how to handle the situation. In the region of Volunteer, a mysterious female figure was watching it through a magical law. She was quite surprised by X combat abilities, as he had conquered Arsenal in just a week. However, this woman also had some concerns about X future. The next morning, ORCS Chief of Staff Duran, along with Ike inspected the city Jerome was worried about the sparse population. But I disagreed, arguing that Arsene was a trade city and without people, there would be no trade. A group of merchants approached it to inquire about the taxes they needed to pay. Jerome was about to scold them for their lack of manners. When I intervened, responding calmly but with a firm reminder, suddenly, I felt something was often narrowly, avoided an attack from a stone golem, only to find himself teleported to another place. I realized he was in the domain of Spyro, the mysterious woman who had been watching him through the magical orb. The golem continued its assault, but I dodged swiftly and shattered it with his staff. So Pharaoh praised Ike's growing strength. So Pharaoh was the commander of the Seventh Legion, a part of the demon army, and also Ike's superior and the only one who knew his secret. So Pharaoh summoned Ike to inform him that the Sixth Demon King, a multitasking demon king wanted to meet him directly. So Pharaoh and Ike then moved to the domain of this multitasking demon king. Back at Arslan Castle, the maid slowly regained consciousness on an invisible wall. There was a note instructing her to wait there obediently. The maid stood up and walked around, unable to resist the delicious food laid out on the table. Meanwhile, at the Dorbird Castle of the Demon King, I finally met the supreme commander of the Demon Army. As the door to the Demon King's chamber opened, I was taken aback to find that Demon King Darrow Kitten was a beautiful girl. I calmly replied that he had only followed so Fyro's orders to capture our slim. The Demon King questioned like about his true demonic nature. This question left like speechless. He hesitated and looked towards a pharaoh, so Viral intervened, stating that I was the grandson of Romberg known as the Protector of Hell. The Demon King continued to probe asking about ex-conquest of arsenic, where he made the soldiers surrender almost without bloodshed. If I was unsure how to respond, the demon army would normally kill mercilessly and rule the inhabitants through fear, but like being human couldn't do that. Unable to stand in silence any longer, I expressed a desire to share his thoughts. He mentioned that in the past, although humans feared terror, they did not obey it comparing a city ruled by demons to one where a human ruler was replaced. The benefits for the demon army were clear. The demon king then asked like if these were Romberg ideas. I could admit it they were from the conversation. I sent some trust from the demon king and wondered if she, I Kim was a reincarnated person. The name Darrow Kitten, which translates to Great Six Demon King, in Japanese reminded I have a well-known character. 
The demon king stood up, walked over to iTunes of Pharaoh, and said that the next time they met, I should show his true face behind the mask. After the demon king left, Ike finally exhaled, relief from the tension akin to a brush with death. So Pharaoh hinted at the reward the demon king had for Ike, which seemed more like a punishment. Ike was to become the lord of a city that dilapidated and ash-covered civilized idolize. Located south of Arsen him might become a frontline in future wars. I its mission was to protect idolize at all costs and to double the taxes. Upon his arrival in the city, he couldn't help but sigh in dismay. Nevertheless, as a lord, I had duties to fulfill. He ordered the city gates to be repaired, followed by the mobilization of engineers and laborers to rebuild everything. His subordinates after assessing the situation informed him that the repairs might take about six months to complete. I thought otherwise considering leaving things as they were, since a city under repair would be an easy target for human attacks. However, this wasn't a viable option, as I realized was a frontline city necessitating the restoration of its gates. I needed more manpower and an appropriate time allocation. He commanded that the work be completed within a month. A few nights later, a man secretly observed the rapid progress of the gate repairs and was astonished. He intended to report back to his superiors promptly. Humans and demons work together day a night under Jerome's strict supervision. It was a sight he had never witnessed before, with shifts changing every eight hours, continuing non-stop for 24 hours. Ike's management style and reward system significantly boosted everyone's morale. Jerome couldn't help but admire Ike, proclaiming him a true genius, and worthy of being called the right hand of the demon army. Returning to his magically sealed room, I was shocked to find the maid from the previous day lying on the floor, her mouth covered in syrup. Observing the surroundings, he noticed a plate on the dining table with signs of being eaten from, deducing that the girl had eaten her fill and then fallen asleep. The maid slowly opened her eyes, mumbling and wondering where she was. Startled by Ike's voice from behind, she immediately knelt down and begged for her life. Willing to do anything, the girl was terrified of dying. Ike assured her he would not kill her and even helped her cut the chains on her wrists. When asked the girl revealed her name is 13, a slave named in sequence, Ike remained silent, then stood up, remembering something he told 13 that now she knew he was human, he couldn't let her just return home. 13 remained kneeling on the ground, asserting that she had seen nothing and promised to protect the secret for her entire life. I believe 13's words, but in return, he demanded that she become his maid from that moment on. This was an order that she had no choice but to accept. Without waiting for it to finish, 13th immediately complied. Thus, a contract between the two of them was officially established. In the domain of the Demon King, her subordinates were reporting on the war situation with the Rosalia region. Overall, it was stable, but Rosalia intended to form an alliance with neighboring countries to reverse the situation. In a small alley in Rhesus, the capital of the Kingdom of Rosalia, there was a street magic game that attracted many spectators including 13. The magician placed a ball under one of three cups and swiftly shuffled them. But mysteriously, when he lifted all the cups, the ball was gone. The crowd suspecting trickery assaulted the magician. I pulled 13 away from the alley and out onto the main street. Today, I was dressed simply to assess the enemy situation. Seeing the summoned soldiers, he surmised that the alliance signing was indeed happening. Actually, this was an old pact activated in emergencies at to removing interests between the countries. Ike further explained that this pact had been activated three times in the past. Each time the demon army was repelled, they were pushed back to Vorwick on the eastern edge. Suddenly, the voice of the street magician called out demanding 13 to stop. He accused 13 of interfering with his cups, causing him to lose money and get beaten up. The man demanded an unreasonable compensation. Ike having witnessed everything, discreetly used his ice, one to turn the legs of the magician's accomplice to ice. Then he threatened the magician by revealing the reason behind the city's military drills. I was surprised to hear that the Rosalia army was planning a revenge strike against the demon army, and the chosen battleground was Idolize, where he had just been appointed as the lord. The following night, the Rosalia army launched a surprise attack on the area bordering Idolize. Besides swords, they were also equipped with large guns guns intended to destroy Idolize at close range. As the order to fire was given armored skeletons, the skeleton army emerged from the ground, while the Rosalia soldiers were in disarray. Goblins, who had been lying in ambush on the hillside with bows and arrows prepared to shoot, by the time Rosalia realized it was a trap, it was too late. Ike's forces quickly overwhelmed them, 
forcing the enemy to retreat urgently, drawn from his observation post. Heaped praises upon IDK. Just as I was about to leave, an arrow struck him in the chest, rendering him unconscious. When he awoke he found himself in a lavishly decorated room, still confused about why he was there. His confusion turned to shock when he saw Sir Pharaoh lying next to him, woken by Ike's scream. So Pharaoh slowly came to. She appeared unfazed by sharing a room with Ike. So Pharaoh had treated and bandaged Ike's chest wound, and before leaving, she reminded him to be cautious as he was still human. After Sapphira left, I sat deep in thought. Back in the kingdom of Rosalia, Deputy Commander Gal Rocha was furious upon learning that the White Wall Knight Order had retreated from rival eyes. Gal Rocha, unconcerned with the reasons for the withdrawal, ordered the immediate imprisonment of Commander Eris T, the leader of the White Wall Knight Order, returning to either lies. I sat in his study, contemplative, holding the arrow that had hit him. He suspected it was from Rosalia. Act dismissed the possibility of a Rosalia spy within Idolize, leading him to consider the likelihood of an internal perpetrator. The interruption by succubus Lilies broke Ike's train of thought. She rushed to his desk, leaning close to inspect his wound. While Lilis was attempting to flirt with Ike 13, and Jiran entered the study, Lilies frustrated by the disturbance, disdainfully addressed 13A human. Lilies and 13 began to verbally spar, each refusing to back down, until Jerome intervened with a reminder. Like summoned Jerome to inquire about the location of Eros T, the commander of the White Wall, Knight order meeting to confirm something. A few days later, Kieran provided information that Eris T was imprisoned, held accountable for the defeat. Upon learning this I immediately arranged to visit Rose alias prison that night. Lilies having overheard this plan insistently followed Ike, though often whimsical Lilies proved useful, swiftly dealing with the prison guards, facilitating X entry. The Rosalia prison was vast and robustly built. Lily subdued another guard and extracted the location of Aris T's cell. However, her actions weren't discreet, and soon the guards were alerted and began to encircle the intruders. I left the guards to Lilies and proceeded to the top floor where Aris T was held, just as I opened the door to Aris T's cell. She lunged at him with a powerful punch, which he narrowly dodged. He responded with a strong strike from his ice wand, knocking Aristi to the ground. I was surprised to discover that Aristi was a woman, having assumed the Rosalia commander was a man. Setting aside his surprise, I directly asked if she had ordered an assassin to kill him. Instead of answering Aristi questioned whether I was truly a demon. In a moment of lowered guard, Eros T managed to point a knife at him, questioning if Ike was actually human. I found himself trapped between two threats. Behind him was already T with a knife at his throat and in front of a group of approaching guards. Without hesitation, I used his super sensory magic to immobilize his adversary. He then summoned the dark wind to blow the guards away. However, the danger was far from over. A giant guard about five meters tall ambushed him from behind. Wielding a spiked hammer, I ever vigilant quickly dodged the hammer's descent in summon the power of darkness to counterattack, causing the giant to plummet downwards. The intense vibrations from Mike's dark magic caused the surrounding balustrade to shatter her at standing. At the edge, fell as well, but I swiftly flew to catch her, and safely landed on the ground. It was then that Ike revealed his identity as the commander of the Seventh Immortal Legion of the Demon Army. In response to a radius question, Ike denied being human. He then cornered Eros T against a wall, demanding confirmation of her involvement in the assassination attempt against him, or at hesitantly, half admitted her role. Suddenly, Lilies appeared, preventing it from further confronting it. After receiving his answer, Ike released Ra T, clarifying he had not come to kill her. Before leaving, he advised her to reflect on her actions following her recent defeat, hinting she should focus on what to do after accepting defeat. Already stood dazed for a long time, even after Ike and Lilies had disappeared. The next day in either lies, I summoned his army to the square, still pondering over the arrow shot at him the previous day. He was certainly it was an enemy's doing, but it didn't seem to involve it directly. I expect elated that the incident might have been staged to appear as a human act. The last possibility I dreaded to consider was the presence of a spy within his own ranks, utilizing dark magic and mind-reading skills. I sought to identify the trader. A goblin soon came forward to confess. That very day, I went to meet Sofero and Valence. Here were somehow Sofira was already aware of its purpose. The culprit I discovered was the vice commander of the Seventh Legion. The one-eyed goblin Jace, with a problem in the army excites a Fyro's council. 
So Pharaoh downplayed the issue, suggesting it could be resolved with appropriate compensation. In low hour Jace was incredulous that I had survived an arrow attack and was now at the captain's place. Jace's anxiety grew when his subordinate reported a loss of contact with the goblin infiltrator in Ike's army. Viewing their plot had been exposed, Ike's sudden appearance startled Jace who tried to maintain his composure, even chastising Ike for being careless enough to get injured. Ike not letting the trader feign ignorance any longer, hinted at his leniency towards betrayers. Jace confident in his own territory, summoned his soldiers to attack Ike. At that moment, so Pharaoh emerged with an army of skeletons creating a shockwave that rattled the region. So Pharaoh's formidable magic summoned gigantic meteors that crashed into little war, causing massive explosions that obliterated buildings and architectural structures. In moments the city of Loar lay in ruins, so Pharaoh ordered her skeletal and giant forces to clean up any remaining survivors, insisting not even an ant be spared. The skeletal army and giants ruthlessly slaughtered Jesu's troops. Jace, scrambling from the collapsing walls, gritted his teeth in fury at the sight of his overwhelmed forces. I presented Jace with two options, surrender peacefully or only after losing everything. Enraged, Jace screamed orders to eliminate Ike. Ike unleashed a supersonic blast of magic, preventing his enemies from advancing. A swarm of goblins, both ground-based and aerial then attacked it from all directions. I countered by conjuring a reflective shield and 1,000 dark arrows, annihilating the attackers instantly, seizing the moment of distraction. Chase attempted to flee. However, he was intercepted by one of Sephiroth's giant horned monsters. Undeterred, the cutting jays used a smoke bomb to vanish into a white haze and continue his escape. Chase after a long flight, crossed the city gates into the forest outskirts. Panting heavily, he intended to retreat temporarily preparing for a real fight against a viral. Suddenly Ike who had tracked him down attacked Jace. I had anticipated Jason's escape, and had placed a tracking parasite on him. Enraged, Jace wanted to demonstrate his vice commander's power to Ike Ike. Unimpressed by Jace, used his supersonic blast to pressure him and then bound him with the roots of trees, pulling his limbs in different directions. Jay surrendered, revealing his true intention to Bree Bike, which was why he was assigned to attack the impenetrable arson him. Jason proposed an alliance with Ike to control the demon army. He tried to manipulate Ike suggesting that their kind should dominate humans and inflict pain, yet they are restricted under the demon king from needless killing. Chase, along with others resented this limitation. As Jay spoke, he struggled free and lunged alike, revealing his true intention to kill him. I anticipated this and used his super sensory magic to immobilize everything, including Jace and stretched him out again. Suddenly Jace's body sprouted abnormal growths, so Viral approached, reminding Jace that he was abandoned, and urged him to reveal the true mastermind. Jace whispered that it was best, to the captain of the Third Legion of Dullahan, shocked so Pharaoh struggled to believe what she heard. At that moment, a one-eyed monster orb appeared, informing Sapphira that the Demon King requested her presence. So Pharaoh unlike immediately headed to the Demon King's fortress upon receiving the order, where Bastille was also present. The statements from Mike's side and base deals were completely contradictory base do, insisted that his version of events was correct and accused to Pharaoh's side of line. So 5-0 not one to back down bluntly labeled base to a terrible person. The Demon King, already aware of the entire situation acknowledged Bosto's duplicity, but chose not to act, reasoning that no demon is devoid of ulterior motives. According to the Demon Demon King, a truly excellent villain deserves a position commensurate with their skills. If Bastille were to be punished for his intentions, then all demons would warrant punishment. When it came to suffer Pyro the Demon King recognized her sincerity but noted that the recent incident occurred due to her inadequate leadership, not wanting to lose two exceptional. Legion commanders, that Demon King decreed a duel, the victor would be deemed right. Based to welcome this enthusiastically sensing an opportunity for gain, the Demon King set the duel for the same day the following week, with the mode of combat being a 50-50 battle between the two legions back in her territory. So Pharaoh explained that in a 50-50 legion battle, the representing commander could command troops but not participate in combat directly. The soldiers in this battle would be magical constructs made from earth known as flood soldiers, acting entirely under the will of the sorcerer with nearly identical abilities among them. Essentially, it was a strategy game based on fair rules. The purpose of a 50 versus 50 battle was to test the commanding abilities of both generals. In this upcoming contest, legion commanders were not required to participate. 
directly and could appoint representatives. However, the outcome of the duel would directly affect the commander status. Initially, so Pharaoh intended to take part herself, but she changed her mind and decided to let Ike handle the battle. I was perplexed by so Pharaoh's decision. She acknowledged his superior command skills, but, as a higher-ranking legion commander, for life was now in Ike's hands, at the Demon King's Dobia Belk Fortress. So Pharaoh contemplated something suspicious, a doubt lingering in her mind. The next day, and I realize I can unexpectedly as 13 if she knew of any method to guarantee victory in the upcoming duel. Unsurprisingly, 13 with no concept of battle couldn't provide a useful answer. I could then pose the hypothetical scenario to 13 about how to handle a forced confrontation, to which 13 suggested attacking from a distance greater than the opponent, a fundamental tactic for gaining an overwhelming advantage. I considered equipping his flawed soldiers with bows, but quickly dismissed the idea. After a few minutes, he realized the need to create guns, and promptly cites a pharaoh, a skilled metallurgist. However, contrary to Mike's belief, Sapphira also had her limitations. Meanwhile, in Avalon, Bastille and his subordinates were evaluating combat weapons. Confidently Bastille instructed his men to prepare a cunning plan. Certain of his victory, back in Idolize, I can counter the Demon King in a sensitive situation unmasked and unrolled. I thought the Demon King wouldn't recognize his true identity, but he was stunned when she called him by his name. Feeling his life hanging by a thread, I swallowed hard and denied being like. The Demon King, however, was fully aware knowing about Ike's past life memories and his human origin. Per subsequent revelation astonished Ike even more. The Demon King herself was once human. I questioned why, knowing his humanity, she still let him hold his position in the Legion. It turned out the Demon King had been observing Ike for a long time and even asked if he knew of historical figures like Ashiba, Hidetoshi, and Maya at Atisha famous generals from the same Goku period. She also mentioned the catchy Mr. Hyde into Kigo Kazumasu, implying that the secondary yet talented individuals had greatly aided her in becoming renowned among people hinting at a parallel with the situation. Just as in her previous world, the Demon King needed capable generals to shape the world as she desired. She had set her sights on Ike believing he could bring much to her cause. The next day, Ike in his study, examined the gun that Demon King had provided. He was surprised she had anticipated his need for a firearm, which made him realize she probably foresaw even more distant matters. Ike sought so Fyro's help to design gunpowder and bullets for the firearm. While the bullet issue was resolved, the gunpowder remained a challenge. Creating gunpowder required charcoal, sulfur, and neither charcoal and sulfur were easily obtainable. But finding nitre or saltpeter, which forms from decomposing organic matter was tricky. I cast Duran to take him to the oldest public restroom in Idolize to harvest nitre. The day of the duel arrived at Dover Belk Square. The atmosphere was electric, with anticipation with the crowd eagerly awaiting the start of the battle, representing either Lies Ike faced off against Base Du of Avalon. Base Du noticing So Fyro's absence, arrogantly assumed she had foreseen her defeat and decided to avoid the battle. His troops were outfitted in Damascus steel armor, the finest metal supplied by the Demon King. Ike reflected on the guns provided by the Demon King, sensing her desire for an equitable match. As the battle cry sounded, Bosto's troops charged fiercely engaging in ruthless combat combat, while IYX forces remained defensively positioned refraining from attacking, base to growing overconfident, was suddenly startled by a series of explosions. Ike's troops, armed with guns fired a continuous barrage accurately taking down base to soldiers. I had drawn inspiration from the three-rank fire tactic used in the Battle of Nogas Tino thus. In this battle, he implemented a two-layered firing squad. This strategy effectively turned the tide of the battle showcasing superior tactical acumen. I clicked up to the highest stands where the Demon King sat his strategy seeming like a demonstration to the Demon King of the tactics he had devised. Ike's forces continued to fire until not a single one of Bastille's defective troops remain. Bastille was officially defeated. The Demon King then offered base to two choices. Commit suicide to preserve his honor or die at his hands. Baths to try to stall for time because, from a hidden area Abalone's assassin was aiming an arrow at the Demon King from behind. The Demon King blocked the arrow, but at that moment, something exploded, followed by a series of blasts around the stands. This was all part of Bosto's plan to overthrow the Demon King and seize power. I remembered asking his grandfather when he would learn white magic. Romberg said that as a demon, I should remember curses instead of learning white magic. Bosto's troops from Avalon rose up, ordered to kill all resistors so Bastille's empire could begin. Bastille sneered declaring the Demon King's army would be his and inviting me to join, promising to appoint him as the captain of the Seventh Legion. I coldly declared Bastille would never become the Demon King and drew his wand of light. 
Bastille ordered his army to finish like, a supersonic blast from like Shadow Spear wiped out Base to his minions, Ike used his wand to directly confront Base to, his magical shield protecting him from Bosto's attack, Avalon forces grew increasingly numerous, and I flew up high, unleashing, a deadly rain that turned the area into a hellish explosion shattering everything, Base Deos had rolled off, still defiantly challenging that this was not the end, what happened next shocked, like Bosto's body stood up on its own, searching for its head to reattach, Base Do is broken limbs slowly reconnected. Base Do mockingly laughed that Axe attack was insufficient to stop his army. Base Do soldiers rose one after another, like the undead. Base Do reiterated he was Dullahan and his army was immortal. No sooner had he spoken than they attacked Ike from all sides. In this situation, I could remain unflinching, using ice magic to freeze a soldier, and then shattering him with a staff. Another blow graced Dyke's face, igniting a fierce anger within him. He summoned magic to amplify feelings, immobilizing the movements of those surrounding him from the sidelines. Base Do shook his head in disappointment, criticizing X foolish choice. He remarked that had I chosen to join his art, I mean earlier, he would have utilized him effectively. Meanwhile, the archer who who had aimed at the Demon King was now targeting Ike through the thick black smoke. Despite a huge explosion, I survived earning Bosto's admiration, for living up to his reputation as the leader of the Immortal Legion. Bastille commanded his army to attack again. Facing this situation, I realized that continuing this way would deplete his magical power. He remembered the white magic his uncle had mentioned, a difficult arc for demons, but different for it due to his human heart. Recalling Weinberg's words, I knew what he had to do. He summoned white magic, astonishing Bastille. Likes white magic enveloped the undead, turning them to dust instantly. Bastille, who had been standing amidst his army, now found himself surrounded by piles of ash. The archer, still aiming at Ake, suddenly felt pain and looked down to see his arms severed. So Pharaoh appeared instantly annihilating him. So Pharaoh's dominus escorts also arrived, handling the cleanup of Avalon soldiers outside. The demon king, who had survived the explosion appeared unexpectedly. She offered base to another chance, a duel with Ike with his life spirit if he won. Base 2 looked at like the battlefield was now reduced to just the two of them face to face. Base 2 confident Ike was no match for him, charged with his thunderous sword without hesitation. I used his magical shield to block the force from base to sword. The shield's power was strong, sending base 2 flying backwards. Undeterred, base 2 charged again swinging his sword at Ike. Ike flew up to dodge, but base 2 followed hurling a fireball. That created a massive, devastating explosion. Bastille thought he had sent it to meet the Grim Reaper, but I compute behind him mocking his ambition to become the Demon King as a petty and foolish aspiration. Enraged, Bastille gritted his teeth. Ike without responding, used white magic to disintegrate base to his body, until once again, his iron head fell to the ground. So Pharaoh was surprised, unaware of when I had learned white magic. I questioned if So Pharaoh had foreseen this outcome, hence her absence from the battle in her preparations in the background. So Pharaoh's wry smile seemed like an acknowledgement. Now, with Bosto's treachery concluded and his position as the leader of the Third Legion vacant, Ike was appointed to fill the role immediately surprised, but unopposed. I accepted the command, returning to normal life. I no longer had to hide his human identity and could live more freely. Thirteen went to find Ike, who was assessing the land's agricultural potential. At the Demon King's fortress, a dispute arose. So Pharaoh insisted that I was her subordinate, so she should have the authority to command him. Summoned to this discussion, that Demon King wanted to hear Ike's thoughts, and so Fira was curious about his decision. Ike reiterated his goal of peaceful coexistence between demons and humans, expressing his desire to continue learning from Sapphira and remaining in her army. He also vowed to make idolized the first city where demons and humans live together. One day, a dark monster of leading an army began slaughtering humans. A hero emerged, refusing to allow their tyranny and swiftly quelled the chaos. In a field, and I realize, I was using magic to create a four-cycle agricultural method, a technique that allowed the farmland to be cultivated indefinitely without rest. Thirteen watched with fascination having never witnessed such a miraculous method. If this piece of work was maintained, it would ensure that neither humans nor demons would ever suffer from famine. Jerome hurried to ache with urgent news. The allied armies of various nations had finally taken action. The night before the Second Legion had been annihilated, raising concerns about the front line near them. Ike expectulated that their next target might be Idolize. He reasoned that the Allied forces would consider Arsenal a critical stronghold, but to reach Arsenal, they must pass through I realize. 
I realized the dilemma if I realized fell arson, then would be in grave danger. The next day, Ike answer Pharaoh visited Fiorentina and Alchemist in the 7th Legion to discuss the manufacture of firearms. Fiorentina had attempted to replicate a few models, but they were only capable of a single shot before malfunctioning. She concluded that mass production of firearms was unfeasible as alchemy could only replicate the detailed structure of the guns and their power and durability were merely at the level of fakes. Ike after observing agreed that their firepower was weak. Fiorentina suggests said using metal and wood to make the parts and then assembling them. So Pharaoh was skeptical, doubting that such small objects, especially made of metal would be effective. The only ones capable of such craftsmanship were the dwarfs, but they had been wondering since their defeat in a past battle with humans. Fiorentina informs of Fira and I about the dwarf king, currently imprisoned in the kingdom of Isnis. Many years ago, during a conflict with humans, Gunther, the dwarf king was adamantly against his tribe's technology, being exploited, leading to his imprisonment, Jerome and Lily's on Ike's orders, easily infiltrated the Isthmus dungeon, and rescued the king on their way out of the dungeon, Kieran and Lily's encountered several humans, despite Ike's instructions not to engage in conflict, or kill anyone, both Jerome and Lily's couldn't restrain themselves, after returning to X headquarters, Gunther was treated with care, upon waking, Gunther was curious about why the demons had rescued him. I got straight to the point about manufacturing firearms. He shared his goal of peaceful coexistence between humans and demons, explaining the upcoming war's need for Gunther support. Additionally, I offered a proposal if Gunther helped him produce a large quantity of firearms. I could petition the demon king to rebuild the dwarf kingdom. Densha initially reacted angrily thinking I was treating him as a fool. However, I had somehow contacted Gunther's son, Batson, as well as his close, associates and relatives, bringing them all to the location. Faced with this situation, Gunther couldn't refuse Ike's request to manufacture weapons. Meanwhile, at the Allied Forces camp, plans were being made to advance into Civilize. Having agreed to X conditions, Gunther personally joined the forge with his associates to increase production. They worked tirelessly with the sounds of welding, hammering, and the constant noise of the forge filling the air. Ike and an associate went to a natural saltpeter mine to obtain materials for gunpowder, after the guns and ammunition were made. Kieran had the troops practice shooting at a training field in preparation for the upcoming battle. Ike's office was bustling with the key commanders of the 7th Legion, Alchemist Fiorentina Commander Gamos from the Dwarf Brigade Commander Bale from the Werewolf Brigade, and Commander Cushion from the Manticore Foam Brigade, despite his new position as Deputy Commander of the Legion. Ike maintained a friendly and approachable demeanor. Ike briefed them on the current situation. Their enemy was a coalition of kings with more than 10,000 soldiers clearly outnumbering and overpowering them in terms of troop strength. Ike's strategy was to conduct a swift and decisive war, minimizing losses while demoralizing the enemy. Gunner's Forge continued to work tirelessly, day and night, while Jiran ensured regular and serious training for the troops. The day of the battle arrived, with the coalition of over 10,000 soldiers from the King's Alliance steadily approaching the gates of Idolize. Ike quoted that I've allies must be protected at any cost, even if it meant sacrificing lives. The enemy general underestimating the small. Fortifications of Idolize ordered an immediate assault, as their troops charged in cannons fired a barrage of Ivalice gates, its prepared magical invisible shield protected the city repelling the cannon fire, Ike then flew forward using magic, from his light one to create cracks in the ground, beneath the enemy soldiers, causing many to fall into the fissures, the enemy deputy commander urgently sought instructions, from their general who ordered a relentless attack, commander cushion of Ivalice forces transformed into a giant, quilling huge rocks at the enemy, however, these were unexpectedly redirected back towards idolized by a long bearded man and a woman, Ike flew to confront these two individuals, meanwhile, the enemy general continued the bombardment, eventually breaching the gates, a vicious melee ensued as one wing of the army stormed in deep in the forest, so Pharaoh had successfully lured a man away from the battle with Ike for a specific purpose. She expressed her long-standing desire to meet him, and as she finished speaking, sharp spikes emerged from the ground. Back at the battlefield, Kieran rallied the troops to prevent the enemy from advancing further into the city. The coalition's strength was formidable, and with their numerical advantage, it was increasingly difficult for Ivalice forces to hold them back. The enemy forces armed with bows, an iron armor unleashed a volley of arrows at ex-goblin warriors. Jerome quickly realized that direness of the situation their melee weapons were inadequate against the ranged assault. If the switch, 
Ovation continued, I-9 forces would soon be defeated and idolized would fall, just when Jerome was uncertain how to turn the tide. Commander Bayux of the Werewolf Brigade arrived. His massive form and sharp claws easily tore through the enemy ranks. Emboldened, Bayo commanded his werewolf troops to join the fray with ferocity. Fiorentina, the dark alchemist arrived just in time to turn the battle. She unleashed demonic spiky orbs into the sky, which exploded and miraculously reconstructed the crumbled city walls. Commander Gamos from the Dwarf Brigade couldn't stay back any longer. Urging his soldiers, he joined the battle to support X forces as the enemy continued their assault on the gates. An enemy general managed to breach the wall sword in hand, aiming for Fiorentina. However, the goblins trained by Jiran Agile and Quick used their guns to shoot him down. Jerome ordered his troops to counter-attack fiercely. The presence of firearms and novelty in this world where only cannons existed for ranged. Warfare took the enemy by surprise. The battlefield descended into greater chaos. Despite this, the enemy didn't retreat, instead calling for reinforcements and preparing to counter-attack with siege engines. Commander Cushion of the Manta Corps found brigade charged into the fray, treating the enemy's siege machines as mere playthings. The Deputy commander of the Allied forces pleaded with their general for a new directive to preserve their forces. The enemy general indifferent to his soldiers' losses, and focused solely on his honor, refused to back down. He believed that failing to capture the small city would tarnish his reputation as a general. He issued another command to attack with their overwhelming numbers still giving them a significant advantage. The battle had been raging for over two hours with no sign of stopping. Jerome was deeply concerned about the current situation, and Fiorentina suggested fleeing due to the overwhelming number of enemy forces. Just then, the ground suddenly split into large fissures, causing the enemy commander's horse to panic and throw him off. I appeared renowned as the deputy commander of the Demon King's Legion, yet still offering the enemy commander a chance to retreat and live. The commander, however, arrogantly chose to fight directly. Unexpectedly, Gunther the Dwarf King intervened, severing the commander's arm. It turned out this commander was the same person who had oppressed Gunther in the past, demanding his tribe's secrets, dividing his people and imprisoning him in his mess. With no other choice, the commander ordered a retreat, sent a question next decision not to kill the commander, warning that next choice might lead to future regret. I can deterred, was ready to face them stronger next time. Meanwhile, in the forest with Sophia Arrow, the tide of battle had turned in her favor and the human hero had been brutally defeated. Thirteen accompanied Ike to a city named Synovia, unfamiliar with the outside world. She was intrigued. I could explain that Synovia was a federal city, also known as a trade federation. It thrived on commerce, dealing in various crops, spices, and virtually anything else. The trip was ordered by Sophia Arrow. A week earlier, foreseeing another potential attack, she emphasized the need for immediate counter-planning. Despite repelling the previous assault, Idolized faced financial difficulties, supply routes were blocked and food reserves were dwindling, so Pharaoh instructed Ike to negotiate trade agreements with the Federation to address these challenges. Ike is still worried about either lies, which has just experienced a war with the Allied forces and fears that the enemy might return. So Pharaoh reassures like reminding him that his current task is to follow the orders given to him. Unable to use teleportation magic to reach Synovia and his party have no choice but to travel by land. Bringing 13 along serves as a testament to the possibility of peaceful coexistence between humans and demons. Suddenly, I can 13 hear a loud scream. A group of bandits is blocking the path of a young lady's carriage. Outnumbered for attendants are severely wounded, spotting the lady the burly, menacing leader of the bandits intends to commit vile acts like arrives. Just in time breaking, through the carriage door and reassuring the girl, enraged the leader yells for his men to attack Hike. However, these corrupt individuals are no match for someone like Ike. I captures them with ropes and hangs them upside down. After dealing with the bandits I goes to the wounded attendants and heals them. The young lady grateful for Ike's help turns out to be Julia Octavio, the daughter of the head of this, an Obia trading company. Upon reaching the city of Zenobia, Julia introduces Icon 13 to her mother, El Toro Octavia, the chairperson of the city's trading guild. Ike not wanting to risk danger, introduces himself under the alias Rai. El Toria, the head of Zenobia and the trading guild, is a woman who has climbed to her position through sheer capability. I think that having saved her daughter might make negotiations easier. However, El Tori is serious demeanor suggests to like that his earlier conclusion might have been premature. El Toria asks her daughter to leave the room then immediately addresses the matter of what the Demon King's army wants from her. It is completely taken aback unable to comprehend how Iltoria could have guessed his intentions. Eltoria, 
is somewhat suspicious of Nine's proposal for cooperation, reasoning that demons have always preferred to remain separate from humans, and that relying merely on a friendship could be dangerous. Ike is undeterred and openly states his goal, to achieve peaceful coexistence between humans and demons. However, El Toria remains skeptical. Ike brings up Snow B as current problem troubles with pirates. He offers to have his forces completely eradicate them. El Torito agrees, but sets two conditions. One to eliminate the pirates and to, to marry her daughter. Julia, El Toria, trusting her intuition feels that someone like Ike could potentially lead the demon race in the future. Suddenly, a secretary rushes in with news that the Red Beard Pirate Gang is attacking the city. The presence of their leader Carroza indicates significant destruction is imminent. Ike is now faced with a critical decision. Ike can 13th hurry to the town's port, where they find utter devastation. Buildings are collapsed, resembling a heap of rubble and bodies are strewn everywhere. Hearing a faint call for help, Ike rescues a man trapped under a carriage. The man reveals that he doesn't know how the pirates got the information, but they seem to be targeting the largest cargo ship in the port scheduled to leave that day. Their numbers may be fewer than I anticipated, but as the man warns their strength is formidable. These pirates are unpredictable and strike when least expected. Julia follows Ike and hesitantly asks to speak with him privately. She confesses that she overheard the conversation between her mother and Ike and expresses her happiness at the prospect of becoming his future wife. Julia admits she has liked it since their first meeting and boldly proposes marriage to him. I guess overwhelmed by her directness, they have only known each other for half a day and still know little about each other. Yet she is proposing marriage. Julia thinks like doesn't like her and despite his explanations, bursts into tears. Thirteen who had been standing outside, witnessed everything but couldn't decipher the expression on Ike's face. Suddenly, she's gagged and dragged away by a pirate, struggling in vain to escape. Ike sensing something amiss, rushes outside, but it's too late Thirteen is gone. The pirate takes Thirteen aboard their ship, intending to offer her as a prize to Carroza, seizing a moment of distraction. Thirteen uses all her strength to flee, calling out for Ike. She runs until she encounters a door hoping for an escape, only to find a vast ocean behind it, a completely unfamiliar in suffocating place. The pirates along with Carroza are in pursuit, back in Zenobia. The man assigned to protect her team apologizes profusely. He was attacked by the pirates and couldn't protect her. Ike decides to locate and deal with the pirate gang, determined not to let 13 be captured easily. El Toria provides IDK with a ship named Scrap Profit for his immediate pursuit on the pirate ship. Carroza forces Study 13 to wear revealing made outfit to serve him. Without any other choice and knowing resistance would only harm her study complies. Thinking of cooking Carroza doesn't object. Even in the kitchen study is closely monitored. She concocts a plan exploiting the pirate's ignorance by using alcohol to start a fire. Seizing the opportunity she runs for her life. Reaching the deck, Saudi remembers the man at the port's words and uses an oil lamp to create a large blaze. The pirates rush to inform Carroza, vowing not to spare Saudi when they find her. Finally discovered Saudi continues to struggle, and mentally cheers herself on believing it will come, just as a pirate is about to strike her leg. It appears, he had promised Sunday he would protect her so if she's in danger, he will come to her rescue, not waiting for Curl SS command the pirates charged at Ike. Ike swiftly dodges them with immense force, and then swiftly dispatches to followers with a staff that creates thunder and lightning. Ike conjures a magical vortex sweeping all the attacking pirates into the air, and dropping them into the sea the ship being in the middle of the ocean. The pirates panic and thrash about helplessly in the water. I checks on Sunday to ensure she is unharmed, deliberately reiterating to make sure she is completely okay. Somebody is touched and thanks Ike for going to such lengths to save someone like her. She still harbors feelings of being just a slave and fears being abandoned at any moment. Ike interrupts her stating there's no reason for a master to abandon their servant. He also acknowledges somebody's trust in him shown by the smoke signal she had created to start the fire. Carroza then emerges, detonating the room. Fortunately, Ike reacts in time, creating a magical circle to protect them both. Carroza is determined to reclaim study, declaring that anyone in his way will die. He unleashes a fierce tornado, causing everything around to be engulfed and exploded. Ike still carrying Sadie, flees as Carroza grows increasingly furious, refusing to let his prey escape from his ship. Carroza continues his assault, blowing up the back of the ship and creating a huge hole. He thinks he has drowned Ike but contrary to his expectations, Ike can emerges from the swirling waves coldly warning him that he won't let him off easily and that he will ensure Karasik can no longer be a pirate. Another massive explosion shakes a vast area of the sea. The huge wave carries Carroza onto the ship's scrap profit and Ike successfully captures him. All of Carroza's 
subordinates in the pirate gang are now at the mercy of the vast ocean. Itoria is surprised that I captured the pirate captain, having expected that someone leading the Demon King's army would have killed him. Altoria agrees to proceed with the negotiation but suggests keeping the matter from the king to avoid unnecessary trouble. In Alaska, the situation is dire, resembling a pile of rubble. The soldiers are exhausted, and the city is heavily damaged. The enemy wants a Lester to starve, and so Pharaoh is determined to deal with them himself. Fiorentina is deeply concerned about so Pharaoh's current condition as her body relies on healing magic. Meanwhile, in Synovia, a festive celebration is underway for Ike, with the city buzzing with excitement. I can study walk together to the event, enjoying their first moments of peace since arriving in the city. Julia rushes over and embraces Ike, having eagerly awaited his return since they were at the city hall. As it enters, he receives numerous admiring glances from the crowd. Eltoria, who had seen her daughter with Ike earlier, calls them over to greet some distinguished guests. The people around Eltoria start talking about Julia and Ike's wedding, leaving Ike bewildered. As the ceremony's host announces the imminent wedding, the glass window shatter and gasp pours into the room, causing chaos. The demon queen appears before I urging him to leave immediately. Sophira is in danger. Ola Esta is in a state of emergency with Safi Roe facing peril. A coalition of nations has initiated an attack and battles are raging on all fronts. The Demon King's army is fiercely resisting with all its might. But so Fyro's fortress is trapped after luring the Demon army inside the human forces have surrounded it. Over 5,000 enemy soldiers have encircled Suffy Row within the fortress. It's a battle-testing endurance. The Demon Queen has arranged for it to leave immediately to save Sapphira. Eltoria, who has been watching from somewhere looks very displeased. It is forced to postpone the engagement ceremony. He must go to Suffy Arrow immediately, using teleportation magic. I take somebody back to I Realize. Just a second ago they were in Zenobia, but now they have returned to I Realize. I quickly puts on a cloak and mask glancing down at the city of Idolize, which now looks more devastated than ever. Jerome rushes in to inform Mike about the total assault by the allied forces who are not only attacking here, but the entire region. Jerome mentions that a young girl came to their aid while I was away, proving exceptionally powerful against numerous enemies. Ike recalls the Demon Queen's words, arranging for him to go save Spyro. He orders to head to Alaska immediately. In the previous battle 100 were wounded and now only about 500 can fight. However, a unit must stay behind to protect the city so the actual number of troops is less. The enemy force says are estimated to be around 5,000. The chances of victory seem slim. This is the only thing I can do. If the main force falls, the enemy will come for him next, and that's why he must reach a less debt before that happens. Meanwhile, the city's inhabitants gather eager to support upon hearing he's in trouble. Duran thinks they're just getting in the way, but the people insist on following Ike. They're determined to protect their lives, not knowing when the battle will end. Under the previous Lord's rule, they lived oppressed, but since I took over the city has prospered, especially when attacked Ike's monster army stood to protect them to their last breath. The people want to repay Ike for this, not only humans, but also the dwarf king Fenter wishes to join the battle. Ike is moved by this unity. Ike hastily devises a strategy to confront the enemy, teaching them to use guns and develop weapons. He prays that Spyro can hold on until he reaches Alaska. The next day, a heavy rain falls in Alaska. The commander of the Dragon Corps II Ruddle personally leads the troops in attacking Alaska, with a catapult causing the city gate to collapse in seconds. The Allied forces break in and a fierce bloody battle ensues, so Pharaoh slightly recovered also joins the fight but the enemy is too strong, and an ambush archer shoots a poisoned arrow at Sapphire a lightning. In the sky signals a bad omen for Ike, so Pharaoh is critically wounded by the arrow falling from a height and surrounded by the enemy. Exhausted and powerless, she can do nothing. The allied forces then captured and brutally killed the soldiers of Alaska, turning them into prisoners of war. They not only break the teeth of the orc soldiers, but also plan to cut out their hearts to sell for money. The corpses are either burned or even burned alive. So Pharaoh is taken to the execution house, tied to an electric chair with both hands and feet bound. Ruddle knowing that a Pharaoh is a general of the Demon King decides not to kill her immediately as using her could benefit him, so he instructs the jailer to keep watch over her. The lecherous jailer is a pharaoh, wondering what a being that looks human, but his different wood tastes like. Lilies appears from behind, 
startling the jailer, she crushes his face with one hand and sucks out his soul until he is reduced to a skeleton. On the observation deck, the enemy guard spot Ike's arrival. With just his staff, I conjures a supersonic whirlwind spell that blows up the enemy's main fortress. Ruddle is informed of the enemy's attack his deputy commander. After reporting the troop numbers, Mark Sykes' force of only 500 confident. They will be quickly defeated. Ruddle not underestimating the demon forces despite having a larger army orders his deputy to gather the troops and fight with all their might. The order is given and the enemy command urgently plans to annihilate the orc army. As he finishes speaking the orcs even though severely injured roar in response. In this situation, Lilies must quickly design the best route to get a pharaoh out safely. The enemy's catapults relentlessly attack the orc battalion, but these warriors are determined to stand their ground. Ike encourages his soldiers to hold the enemy at any cost until Suffy Arrow can escape. Inside the Lester Lilies leads the way well. Fiorentina supports a pharaoh. Unexpectedly, Fiorentina is severely injured by an enemy mag spell struck through the abdomen. The mage does not allow so pharaoh side to escape easily, and orders his soldiers to charge and kill everyone without exception. Lilies along with the orcs rushes in to protect Spyro. Spyro! sitting beside the dying Fiorentina, is unaware of the impending danger behind her. As the mage prepares to attack Sefero Lily's manager's only a warning shout. So Fero, unable to use her magic in such a critical situation, resigned herself to her fate. Suddenly, a gunshot pierces the mage, followed by three more volleys. These are Ike's reinforcements, people who respect and admire Ike. Armed with swords and guns, they unite and fiercely attack the enemy. Kieran arrives to rescue So Fero from the chaos. The allied forces still complacent underestimate the Demon King's army. Suddenly, dragons appear in the sky carrying Gunner's homemade bombs, ready to drop them on the enemy. When I expand barrels fall, the entire enemy rampart is utterly destroyed. The attacking soldiers are almost all killed, and the ramparts burn to the ground amidst thick smoke and fire. Ruddle after observing the situation, realizes he cannot risk further confrontation with, if the demon forces, and immediately orders a retreat. The enemy withdraws leaving a Lester in ruins much like I've realized was initially. Humans start treating the orc's wounds before beginning to rebuild the ramparts. Bale, the commander of the Wolf Brigade, and Garmos, the commander of the Dwarf Demon Brigade, return to Idolize to assess the situation. After this battle, so Pharaoh truly reminds herself not to underestimate humans. She finally meets like post-battle, and praises him for his excellent performance. The Demon King Mao arrives in a Lester to inquire about so Pharaoh's health. Mao not only refrains from blaming Sapphira, but also praises the 7th Division for their brave fight despite being leaderless and considered the weakest. Moreover, Mao's reason for coming is to promote it to the commander of the 8th Division, the Immortal Legion. So final requests now to take care of Ike like a younger brother, acknowledging his flaws but still hoping for Mao's support, now wholeheartedly agrees. Deep in the forest, twin sisters with arrows suddenly noticed they are being followed. Under the shadow of the trees, two bright eyes are watching them, accompanied by a loud growl. Back in Idolize, Jerome is excited about like becoming a division commander. Ike's current force only numbers 800 and a typical division consists of at least 3,000. Elite soldiers, so like plans to recruit members from other races. Jerome worries about the acceptance of other divisions. But Ike is undeterred, wanting to follow his own path. Gunter visits. Ike can hand him a letter from Fair Let, the queen of the elf race and the dwarf's eternal enemy. Gunther quotes Fairlift's words, if the elf do not join the allied forces war will ensue. According to Gunther, the allied forces fear an ELF alliance with the demons hence the threat. The elf is intent to ally with the demons, but lack complete trust, thus reaching out through the dwarfs to Ike. However, it could also be a trap if the elf and the allied forces are collaborating. Ike decides to confirm this personally and heads to the elf forest that day. In elf territory, the Allied forces have sent diplomats to negotiate with Fair, let, but do not demand an immediate response. Fairlight indeed sent the letter to Gunther hoping he would inform Mike about the current situation of her people. Ike party includes himself, Gunther Lilies and Sadie. On the way somebody expresses her curiosity about the fairy kingdom, and Gunther briefly explains, mentioning the world tree, an ancient tree thousands of years old. Suddenly, Lily senses something amiss and from the forest edge, a large and fierce creature emerges. This beast is enormous, possibly 100 feet tall. It growls and suddenly charges like. Gunther steps forward and throws his axe at it, but misses. Ike summons power into his staff and fires a dark fireball at the beast. There's a loud explosion, but somehow the creature avoids the attack. It leads over Ike, 
despite his use of a magical shield, and heads straight for study, a girl rushes out and decapitates the beast with her sword. The beast's head falls and gradually dissolves into a magical stone. These two girls are subjects of Queen Fair Let sent a guide like to her. Upon reaching elf territory Fair Let personally greets Sykes' group. Although Fairlight appears young, she is actually over 300 years old. She explains to Like the difficulties her people are facing and wants to hear his opinion on an alliance with the fairies. Ike states that an alliance is only successful if both parties benefit. Fairlet understands and offers herself to Like, which causes a misunderstanding, making Lilies instantly furious. Fair, Let clarifies that an immortal king like wouldn't harbor such desires. She means I can use her flesh and blood as valuable magical ingredients. Fairlift's servant is shocked by this proposal. Ike knows that the blood of high-ranking fairies is considered divine and their tears can turn into rare jewelry, but he is not interested in alchemy. Instead, he wants a fairy warrior division. This surprise is fair left, for Ike's strength is his primary concern now. Gunther speaks up, noting that while fairies and dwarfs are like water and fire, they share a common love for peace. He cites the suffering of the dwarfs in conflicts with humans, not wanting other tribes to endure the same fear let decides. Wishing only for the protection of her forest, the allied forces have already made their first move sending troops into the forest. The commander of this troop reminds the mage not to underestimate the forest known as that no-return war. It's this is due to a magnetic field created by earth spirits that disrupts compasses and their spirits that mislead one sense of direction, meaning humans who wander in will never find their way out. The mage comes up with a sinister idea to burn the entire forest, forcing the fairies to flee. Ike had anticipated that the alliance of kings aware of a potential pact between the demons, and the fairies sent the royal mage to create the beast to confirm this. Anemone, Fairlift's twin sister also appears. She looks much stronger than her sister and has a bold personality, openly expressing her disapproval of an alliance with the demons. Ike recognizing the difference in strength still believes he has a strategy for victory. As the allied troops delve deeper into the forest, Ike has already positioned some elite warriors from the Fairy Warrior Legion in ambush. His plan is to scatter the enemy formation and exploit their confusion to cut off their supply lines. Then he instructs his forces to repeatedly execute surprise attacks and retreat effectively using guerrilla warfare tactics. A section of the allied forces sent to track down the fairies ends up lost for days. They wander aimlessly, not only unable to find the fairies, but also losing their sense of direction entirely. Exhausted and mentally unstable, they become desperate. Suddenly, one soldier is ensnared by tree vines gagged so he cannot scream or struggle. Then the second, third, and fourth soldiers suffer the same fate, with only for remaining they finally look up in shock. A horrific sight meets their eyes. An ancient 1,000-year-old tree with a human-like face using its vines to tightly grasp their comrades. The remaining soldiers are terrified and losing their composure to rescue their comrades. They start fleeing in panic. Anemone observing from above remains cold and detached. Ike communicates with Anemone telepathically, reminding her that one of the guerrilla warfare principles is not to chase the enemy too far. He is monitoring an ME as it's necessary for directing the battle. Anemone is growing impatient, unsure how long this tactic needs to be maintained. Ike remains calm, planning to continue this strategy until the allied forces give up. The enemy psychology will be dominated by the constant fear of when and where the next attack will occur, leaving them in a perpetual state of alertness and anxiety. They will be unable to rest gradually becoming exhausted, and the forest will turn into a living hell for them. Fairy Tail visits X room to inquire about the battle situation. Like the other girls she is also affected by X aloofness. She shyly brings like a pot of stew and quickly leaves. Lily's contact Psyche, saying she has reached her limit and can't help but absorb the souls of the enemy soldiers. After doing so she is discovered by other enemy troops, and pursued screaming for Ike's help. Ike asks Anemone to survey the terrain, and plans for her to prepare the best ice spirit warriors for the final strategy. Gunther Lilies and Anemone listen intently. Lilies will lure a large number of enemies near a large water body, and then the three of them will collaborate to easily drive the enemy out of the forest. Ike plans to end this quickly. Gunther leads the spirit warriors into battle against the allied forces. Their exceptional combat skills enable them to kill a significant number of enemy soldiers. The enemy mage summons a lion-headed beast to sweep through the ranks of the spirit warriors. Anemone, seizing the right moment orders for troops to move towards the lake as instructed by Ike. As the enemy pursues them to the lake area, the lake's surface cracks, plunging all of them into the icy waters below. The mage, infuriated, refuses to accept defeat without eliminating his enemies. His arrogance and madness are abruptly quelled. When it appears with a gigantic python, Ike uses his tree roots to bind the mage, and drags him into the middle of the horrified enemy soldiers. The
The battle isn't over yet, but it has already orchestrated a perfect plan. His longhorn dragon troops appear in succession, determined to spare no one within reach. The battle ends with a decisive victory for Ike and the fairies. Back in Idolize, Leestia the leader of the White Rose Knights comes to me like, the battle is over, and like returns with his troops. It turns out that the Longhorn Dragons were reinforcements sent by the Demon King to support Ike. It will take about seven days to reach five allies, but since the fairies have now allied with the demons, the alliance of kings will not leave them in peace. Ike must prepare for the next battle upon his return. As time is of the essence, this time Anemone and the spirit warriors from the fairy clan join AG Safe Legion. Ike uses teleportation to return to idolize with Saudi first. Upon his return, Ike immediately dives into paperwork. I believe self-sufficiency in food production is now over 100%, meaning they can start exporting to other cities. Thanks to the dwarfs the industry is thriving, and make plans to reward Gunther accordingly. Jerome rushes into next room, Burger Lee reporting that humans have come to meet him. Alistia has come to talk to Ike on a secret order from the king. After a pause she continues, the king wants to normalize relations with the demon king's army. This proposal was something I had never considered. Alistia says that they will relinquish control of the lands currently held by the demon king's army. Additionally, to prove their desire for peace, the king's side will provide gold for the next few years. Ike wonders why Alicia is the one discussing this matter, and not other commanders. She responds that it's because she trusts Ike personally, although it is unclear about her intentions. He notices her restless demeanor, which draws his attention. He reports this to the demon king Mao for guidance. Mao thinks it's a reasonable offer if humans adhere to their promise, but remains skeptical about the intentions of those behind the least here. The alliance of nations united nominally to support Rosalia makes it uncertain whether a peace agreement can be signed based solely on King Roselia's decision, so final suspects that the royal army and the alliance are preparing a large-scale counterattack. Behind the scenes and other division commanders might strongly oppose this. Mountain trust site with handling the negotiations with Rosalia. Ike when leaving wonders why Spyro thinks other commanders would oppose. So Fibo explains it's a potential scenario, and if it does happen, or rebellion would be understandable. She also reminds Ike to be wary of humans, as they are capable of launching surprise attacks. Ike meets with Lee's Tia the next day, still wanting her to explain why she said she trusts him. After being defeated by Eken losing confidential documents, or Lee's Tia had intended to commit suicide. However, Bike's words at that time inspired her to continue living, to protect those she loves. Alicia takes it to the negotiation site. The young king of Rosalia Tristan Free is already there. Ike quickly mobilizes his troops to the location. The camp that has been set up serves as the location for the negotiations. Ike can trust and three sit facing each other with their respective armies behind them. As the seal is pressed, the agreement is established. Trust in three speaks first adopting a friendly attitude, expressing his hope for Ike's support from now on. Ike politely responds stating that the demon race also desires peaceful coexistence. The royal politicians applauded seemingly relieved that the years-long war has come to an end. Ike does not forget his promise to rebuild the dwarf's country. Gunther feels that it has provided them with a wonderful place called Idolize, where they can work and live the only difference being that it's not Wilhelm. Durin takes responsibility for safeguarding the treaty and bringing it back. Suddenly, there's news of a revolution in the capital. Intelligence reports that the Prime Minister has deposed Tristan III and placed his brother Lambert on the throne, establishing a new government. The politicians start discussing fervently considering it an outrageous and unforgivable act. Furthermore, other kings in the alliance are reported to have agreed with the Prime Minister. Alicia intervenes stating that the king's sister is present so any application declaration is invalid. Ike performs a small magic trick shattering Roselli is national seal, supposedly made from Abyssinian. The replaced seal is a fake and it's clear that those people had planned the switch in advance. Trust in three suspects that they are on their way here. He figures that even if the revolution succeeds through the seal switch, those involved would never let the legitimate king him live. Ike suggests Tristan III entrust him with command of the White Knights and the Royal Guards. He assures Trust and Three that he will restore his kingship. Some politicians expressed skepticism and opposition. Ike reminds them to think carefully as this as a human matter, unrelated to the demon race, for Tristan Three to regain his throne and protect the peace. The right decisions must be made. After deliberation, Trust in Three immediately delegates the commander of his military forces to Ike. 